Born in San Fernando in 1946, Patrick Manning grew up close to the Point of Pear Petroleum Refinery, which was then owned and operated by U.S. company Texaco. The young Manning dreamed of a career in the oil field as a geologist, and after completing his BSc degree in geology at the University of the West Indies Mona campus, he was well on the way to fulfilling his dream. However, fate, it seemed, had bigger plans for Mr. Manning. He worked at Texaco for not very long. He came back from Jamaica. He went abroad on a Texaco scholarship, and he came back uh, to uh, make sure that his commitment was met. But he didn't last long because they asked him to become a member of parliament. And in a short while, he had to get approval from Texaco to be able to move on, and he did. When the offer was made, he thought about it, he weighed the pros and the cons, he chatted, we chatted about it, he spoke to other people and then took his decision. And the minute that decision was made, there was no looking back. And that's how he, he went about all the time making decisions. Deep, reflective, and once it's made, that's it. In May 1971, Patrick Manning would be sworn in as the Member of Parliament for San Fernando East at the age of 24, becoming one of the youngest persons to be elected to represent the people. He was now set on a path from which there would be no turning back. His faith, family and personality would anchor him through the exciting and sometimes tumultuous times that lay ahead. He learned to be humble from his parents. His father rode from Coquille to Point of Pierre to go to work. And Patrick knew what it was to want, to not have things, but to make do with what he had. To believe that there will always be a time when things will change and things will get better. His love of people, his love of truth, his love of life, his enjoyment of life, all of those, I think, contributed to making him who he was. Patrick was one of those fellas who was a typical Trinidadian. He loved the line, he loved a good party, he loved having friends around him, and he would be in a situation where you felt comfortable. You, were, you, you being around Patrick meant that you were at ease. Because of that journey from ministry to ministry, it has made me a better prime minister. Following his election as the member for San Fernando East, Patrick Manning would be thrust into the role of parliamentary secretary. He would serve in several ministries, including the Ministry of Petroleum and Mines from 1971 to 1973, as well as the Ministry of the Prime Minister from September 1973 to June 1976. Yes, he was selected by Eric Williams and went up on San Fernando East and won his seat without opposition. There was no other contender and he never looked back. Eric Williams, in my opinion, had him on a training uh, program as parliamentary secretary because he came from Texaco, he came from the private sector, and therefore as parliamentary secretary, he moved from ministry to ministry. He wasn't too pleased to be parliamentary secretary for so long, but in hindsight, many years after, he was able to say, do you know something? Because of that journey from ministry to ministry, it has made me a better prime minister. I understand the workings of many ministries, if not all the ministries, and you actually saw it in cabinet. In his cabinet meetings, sometimes he would know more about the ministry than the minister who was in charge of the ministry. By the questions he would ask and by how he would respond to some of the answers that he got. So that training program really helped considerably to make him the kind of leader that he was at the end of the time. It was in these early years that Mr. Manning's 
strengthened his bond with his constituency of San Fernando East, a bond that will see him consistently re-elected to serve the district for 44 years. Both production and prices went up and Trinidad enjoyed a very, very prosperous time. Trinidad and Tobago was plunged into mourning with the sudden death of Dr. Eric Williams on 29th March 1981. In the aftermath, George Chambers, a deputy political leader of the ruling PNM and relative unknown personality on the national stage, was selected from within the party to become the country's new prime minister. Patrick was really very sad on the, when Eric, Dr. Eric Williams died. He respected him highly. He loved working with him. They worked closely. He was in charge of the residence, so he did a lot of work in the residence with him. He was in the Ministry of Works, I think, at that time, and therefore he worked closely with him. When he died, because of his sudden death, it was really a shock. And at the time of his death, Patrick was the Parliamentary Secretary in, in Public Relations. And so therefore he was the, the voice out there talking about the arrangements for the funeral, talking about the details of a number of things that would impact on his life and on his death as they began looking back and reflecting and planning forward. So he was, he was, he was affected by his death, very sad and worried about what the future would hold. Mr. Chambers, Prime Minister Chambers was a colleague Patrick's when they were in government. Remember, he was there for some years before. So they worked closely together at that time. And then when he became prime minister, when George Chambers became prime minister, Patrick was made a minister at that time. He became minister of industry and commerce at one time, minister of energy at another time. His relationship with George Chambers was quite good. A number of the senior man ministers had left by that point in time. They had either not been accepted and appointed again, or they had willingly left the government at that time. So that he became a kind of senior minister, a senior member of, of government uh, because of the changeover. He got along well with George Chamber. Yes, he was a different personality. He was quieter. He was uh, more um, retiring in personality, and, but very detailed and very much moving forward. Uh, they worked together and they worked well. It was no easy task for George Chambers, stepping into the shoes of a man who embodied both charisma and mystique, whose political achievements were the stuff of legend, earning him the distinction of being called affectionately the father of the nation. George Chambers successfully led the PNM to victory in the 1981 electoral race. However, the five years that followed would be characterized by economic turbulence, rising unemployment, decreasing oil production, falling foreign currency reserves, and rapid inflation. The citizens of Trinidad and Tobago were not well prepared to handle the country's changing reality as global oil prices, which had fueled the boom of the 1970s, declined steadily. Trinidad is wedded to the petroleum industry and uh, we went through a boom um, in the early 1970s following the Arab-Israeli war. Um, both production and prices went up and Trinidad enjoyed a very, very prosperous time. But by the time the petroleum prices started to slide, um, the country went into a period of um, very, very um, low growth and um, difficult economic times. Um, during the whole of the, virtually all of the 1980s. The economic downturn was a major factor that led to the PNM's resounding defeat at the polls on December 15th 1986, when the party lost to the National Alliance for Reconstruction, an amalgamation of disparate parties by a margin of 33 seats to three. Patrick Manning, 
Muriel Donovan McDavidson and Morris Marshall were the only PNM MPs to retain their seats. He was sworn in as the country's opposition leader on the 29th of December, 1986, and at the party's convention held on February 8th, 1987, Patrick Manning was elected political leader of the People's National Movement. He famously remarked that the PNM in opposition was the government in waiting. With that in mind, he set about doing the work of rebuilding the party. The PNM lost elections 32-3, and uh, it was the beginning of a lot of reflection by Patrick Manning. Uh, initially, Patrick didn't realize that, he, it, that it was three of them. He thought a fourth member had won. He thought John Donaldson had won his seat. So when he went to bed that night, he was, okay, it's four of us. And because of the senior seniority of John, of John Donaldson, he assumed that John Donaldson would then become prime minister, or then, sorry, then become leader of the opposition. To his shock, he realized that John Donaldson had not won his seat, and therefore that the three of them would then to take go forward. Patrick, as I said before, Manish Manning, got, took, took up his mantle and ran with it. He believed it was God-given. As he said, you know, I was not planning for this. I didn't put anything in place for this to happen. This just happened. Now, what do I do with it? And therefore, he began a journey of walking the country and listening to people to have a clear sense of what it is people wanted. Why it is that the PNM was no longer the favored party what it is could I do to make sure things are better, things would improve. And by that journey, he began to develop a plan. I'll give you an example of that, of his character and his determination. When PNM lost the election to the tree, Patrick withdrew. He sort of felt as if he had done us all wrong. When I say us, I meant the country. And I told him, I say, Pat, things tough. He said, no, we stumbled a bit. I say, but things really not looking good. He said, oh, ye of little faith, ye of little faith. He said, things will turn. He liked to be challenged. He always liked a challenge, whatever it was. When he embarked on that famous, now famous walk throughout Trinidad, the length and breadth of Trinidad, every single constituency Patrick walked through. And he had to listen then. He was told some of the most vile things, some of the most depressing things, and he took it all in. He listened to everybody, all what they had to say. He listened. And, and therefore, that's the beginning of his 33 reign um, in Parliament, where they were battered by the 33, but they stood up and they fought, and at the end, in five years, they were able to win elections again, which nobody believed that they could have done. The People's National Movement, under the leadership of Patrick Manning, defied all odds to reclaim political power a mere five years after the devastating loss in 1986. Patrick Manning had proven his political prowess, rejuvenated the party, and gained the people's trust that he could lead the country into the future. And so every pillar, every development pillar was focused on improving the lived experience of all citizens. In his role as Prime Minister, Patrick Manning's confidence and audacity came to the fore as he took on the challenge of leading the country on the path to economic and social prosperity. This involved making bold and sometimes controversial decisions. 
and Patrick Manning was instrumental in rebooting Trinidad's energy economy. He did so by several means. Patrick understood that you had to have implementation capacity. He tried broadly by trying to reform the public service. He had Gordon Draper as a minister attached to doing that. But that was a long-term process coming up against all the difficulties with the service commissions and so forth. So Patrick realizing that that was a long-term payout and a short-term result and restructuring was required. Patrick pulled together and led the energy, con um, energy economy reform. He did so by organizing a standing committee on energy in which all of the players um, from NGC, Petrotrin, um, through all of the TN Tech and, and other utilities all sat around the table and we discussed what was required and came up with a game plan and implemented that game plan with Patrick in the chair. And any obstacles that came up to the implementation of that plan weren't kicked down the line right around the table. The problems were surfaced and responsibility given to the required um, head of department to resolve that difficulty. Um, to encourage upstream investments, we had a whole set of new tax incentives and to make sure that that was properly implemented, we had John Andrews come in and restructure the taxation so as to make sure that that happened on time. The gist of all of this is that we attracted hundreds of millions of dollars in new investment that flowed into the upstream and petrochemical sectors that rebooted the energy sector and launched Trinidad on a growth path that the early investments in were taking place between 1990 and 1995 and the dividend paid out started to pay out in 1994 when the economy turned. An avid chess player, Patrick Manning would look far ahead when making strategic decisions. Inevitably, some strategies required sacrifices, which worked better on some occasions than others. In October 1995, Prime Minister Manning took a calculated risk, calling elections after only three years in office, and he paid the political price. In 2003, Patrick Manning would introduce a strategic plan for progressing the country to first world status by the year 2020. The plan, Vision 2020, was developed by cross-functional teams of dedicated citizens who believed that the people of Trinidad and Tobago had the inherent talent and capability to transform the economy and society. Vision 2020 was a clearly articulated national strategic plan for Trinidad and Tobago. Its main features included a comprehensive vision statement. Mr. Manning loved including um, to commence meetings by reading out the vision. Um, I want to honor him by reading it now. It says by the year 2020, Trinidad and Tobago will be a united, resilient, productive, innovative and prosperous nation with a disciplined, caring, fun-loving society comprising healthy, happy and well-educated people and built on the enduring attributes of self-reliance, respect, tolerance, equity and integrity in which every citizen has equal opportunities to achieve his or her fullest potential. The vision included plans for improving the nation's energy security, facilitation of renewable energy, as well as the creation of spaces and support of education for culture and the arts. I would say that there was buy-in by some people 
but to say full and that the question is very um is a very good question because it says was there full buy in and no there was not full buy in but there was buy in by some people um and so i believe this lack of full buy in began with the rejection of the carefully developed national strategic plan vision 20 by the parliamentary opposition so with the lack of acceptance and validation in the parliament it was then an uphill climb for a national rule out Mr Manning then took the decision to demonstrate what was possible when we followed the plan. He wanted to show the pu- public, you know, population this is what happens when you have um gates which is, you know, full tertiary education, your tertiary education being fully paid for um um what what he one one of the a major part of vision 2020 was education from nursery to tertiary and so there was a big roll out of early childhood education centers and training for early childhood teachers there was a big um move especially i think this is the one something that i liked a lot was there was a, a a big focus on training a lot of social workers to ensure that you had social workers in the school system in the education system to really help students who would have been um in situations of poverty in situations of of challenges at home and so part a big part of of the roll out to try and get that buy in was really to show people what it meant what it felt like and then Mr Manning set out to really lay down um the revenue generation um projects that would diversify the economy and so on um but again you needed a lot more time because remember if you have started the vision in 2002 and you're aiming to 2020 if as you are beginning to take off and in 20 2008 to 2009 you are beginning to see things coming together you see in the waterfront and so on but then all of those efforts you had and, and for example you had um, the summits major international summits being held there but they were all um they were all what I, what I would say overshadowed to some extent by a lot of protests and a lot of of oppositional talk about a lot of other things that kind of made vision 2020 seem like something bad i think his greatest achievement for trinidad and tobago came with some prompting because it was a difficult decision for him was the setting up of the heritage and stabilization fund which fund gave the country some protection against the volatility of oil and gas pricing and petrochemical pricing and which also um was set aside a saving fund that has stood the test of time and to this day the heritage and stabilization fund holds several billions of US dollars um to the credit of Trinidad and Tobago that fund was set up in 2007 Patrick Manning's vision, while focused on Trinidad and Tobago, expanded beyond our borders to the entire region. He always wanted as a matter of public policy to push for the deepest, broadest form of integration which the political market could bear. He wanted nevertheless to see the deepest possible union among those countries which were the former countries the countries of the former federation and he saw integration in a profoundly organic sense in that the strengths and weaknesses of each unit of each state would be dissolved into the whole so that at the end of the day the whole is greater than a summation of the individual parts and that is why he was so interested in helping particularly the less developed countries in the caribbean and 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 had a particular particular soft spot for 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 the countries in the windwards and leeward islands he was clear 
that what we had as the CARICOM, which is a community of independent sovereign states, he wanted to see a stronger center, an executive mechanism, something similar to the European Commission. Because he was cognizant of the fact that you can't drive CARICOM with just an administrative secretariat. It must have authority given to some center, which in certainly in one bundle of matters, that is to say, the Caribbean single market and economy, that that center ought to have some supranational authority. And he was really very respectful of leaders. He was a good follower as much as he was a good leader. Patrick Manning was appointed Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago on four occasions. First in 1992, then again in 2001, 2002, and 2007. In 2010, Manning would try his luck once more, calling elections more than a year early. Though the economy was buoyant at that time, issues of rising crime and allegations of corruption dominated the election campaign. The PNM would once again be defeated by a coalition of five parties. Ever the statesman, whether in victory or defeat, Patrick Manning would tender his resignation as political leader of the PNM on the 27th of May, 2010. He would continue to represent San Fernando East as the elected member of parliament until 2015. And when he lost again in 2010, yes, he took it, he said, this is my, I have lost again. He never blamed anybody, this, I did it, my, my responsibility. And he normally would, he started to do exactly what he normally would do. Go to the constituency office, listen to the people, see how he could help, plan again as to, as to moving forward. In 2010, however, the leadership had changed. It had moved from him to Dr. Keith Rowley. He understood that, he accepted that, and he began dealing with his people, doing what he had to do. He honored Rowley as a leader, and he was really very respectful of leaders. He was a good follower, as much as he was a good leader, and therefore he began doing that. The reason why he, it, it became a little bit more distant is that at some point in time, Patrick suffered a stroke. And in suffering that stroke, um, what he was accustomed doing, uh, he could not have done anymore. So yes, it was sad, but he found a way to, to move forward, to advise, to support, to hold hands. February 8th, 2012, marked the end of an era in Trinidad and Tobago politics. Patrick Manning, former Prime Minister and the longest serving member of Parliament, failed to appear for consideration by the PNM's Candidate Screening Committee. Manning, due to ill health, quietly exited the political stage. Patrick began walking away from politics when he lost the elections. He was no longer political leader. So he had to take a back seat, and he did. And when he became ill, then the distance was even more because he just couldn't cope after suffering a stroke. But you know, um, he, it was sad. He was, that was his life. And there was nothing else that he could have done. But he spent his time talking a lot, talking to people. A lot of people visited him, sometimes with notebook and pencil and pen with a recorder, just to get information from him. And he spent time talking to people, explaining what it was all about, going back through things he had done, and people were documenting. Prime ministers from the Caribbean would come to visit him. Other people would come to visit him, sometimes just to take notes. 
and he spent a lot of time doing that, reflecting and going back. So yes, it was sad, but he found a way to, to move forward, to advise, to support, to hold hands. I know this man as more than anything else, a Caribbean man who happened to have been born in Trinidad and Tobago. On July 2nd, 2016, Patrick Augustus Moving Manning, husband, father, brother, leader, friend, and champion of Caribbean unity, departed the earthly realm. He was surrounded by his loved ones. It is the times when there's a trough that a great leader appears. Dr. Williams appeared at the time of the oppression of colonialism. George Chambers was there in our moment of great sadness similar to this when Dr. Williams passed away. And Patrick Augustus Mervyn Manning appeared after 1970 when he could have chosen a life of great reward to himself and his family because in those days a young geologist highly qualified entering a job at the oil refinery could have lived a bright and prosperous life but as a very young man he gave up that and that was an indication to us that this was a man who was prepared to give one of my favorite poets is W.B. Yeats, an Irishman, Walter Butler Yeats. He has a poem called The Second Coming. In this particular poem, he has a turn of phrase which says, the best of all lack conviction and the worst are, are full of passionate intensity. In Patrick's case, he was the best. He had the conviction, he had the commitment and Contrary to what Yeats said, he had a passionate intensity, but not a passionate intensity which was infantile, not a passionate intensity which lacked any kind of reason. It was something solid and deep because he was quintessentially a Caribbean man. From the time I knew him at university in 1968, and we got to know each other from then. From that time, 67, 68, I know this man as more than anything else a Caribbean man who happened to have been born in Trinidad and Tobago. And a Trinidadian patriot, but a Caribbean man. I miss his laughter. That full truthed laugh he used to laugh. I, miss, I just miss him being around. Hearing him talk about what life was like, how simple it was, how nice it was. He had a tremendous sense of humor and sometimes you didn't know when he was joking or when he was deadly serious. But if you had lived with him the way I did, you would know. In 1987, he and I went in the teeth of the 
gale of the NAR domination of the political landscape, we went to Sumat Gardens to conduct a political meeting one Sunday afternoon at two o'clock. Picture the place, picture the time, picture two PNM leaders. And we sat in this house, it must have been the only house in the area that would allow us to set up our PA system in front of them. And we sat there and waited for the people to come to this three o'clock meeting. And an hour passed and no one came not a single soul so we were having a drink with the householder and then he turned to me and said rowley start and i said start what he said start the meeting i said but there's nobody there but i noticed he wasn't laughing so i got up and i went to the microphone and i spoke for an hour to no one and then I thought that was the end of it because I thought he had played a joke on me. So I came back into the house and I sat down and he walked to the microphone and he spoke for 45 minutes. And then I knew that was a man who was never asked you to do what he wouldn't do himself. And when he came and I said, what was all this about? He said, they didn't come, but the homie, the house listening. <laughs> Patrick felt at the time of his death, that people did not appreciate what he had done. The, the, the bad talk was so loud that his concern was that they didn't understand what I, was, what I stood for and what I did. And, and, and that was sad for me. But and what really, I tell you what it did for me, because people came after he died and said to me, you know, a lot of Patrick stories, you know, if it, wasn't because, if it wasn't because of Patrick Manning, my daughter would not now be a doctor. If it was not for Patrick Manning, I would not be living in this house now. If it was not for Patrick Manning, a whole lot of things suddenly happened because it was Patrick Manning. And I always would ask, did you tell him? Did you tell him thanks? You're now telling me this, that, you know, if it wasn't, thank you. And they would say, no. And I said, it is so sad that you never said, said it to him or said thanks to him because he didn't have that sense that people appreciated what he did. What it has done for me is that I tell people now, way before I can leave here, thank you for what you did, thank you for this. But it was one of the lessons I learned that after the bad talk, after all the things that were said, suddenly people are saying, uh, if it wasn't, suddenly there was a whole lot of love and even up to today, it's back into this policy would have worked and that policy would have worked. And if, you know, it is so, maybe, I don't know, so people, so people and so sad. He always used to say that there is no right way to do the wrong thing. He was a man of integrity. He was really a, a visionary. He was very futuristic in his thinking. And to my mind, this is how I remember him. And this is how he should be remembered. He's remembered as a titan. Patrick would love to be remembered for Vision 2020, where he had that feeling, that real deep feeling that Trinidad and Tobago could become a model for the rest of the world. He believed that we had the latent talent and capacity and ability to really shine. And if only we were given the chance as a people that we would become a model for the rest of the world. I believe he'll be remembered as a people person, a family man, a statesman, a visionary, and a leader. I think those are the words that define him the best and those who knew him uh, would think of those things immediately when they decide to think about him. Patrick Manning was essentially principle-centered. He grew up with a religious background and based on his religious beliefs, he created a belief system for himself. 
and those principles were based on his religion, based on, for example, the Ten Commandments, he was Christian. And he was a man who adhered to strict principles. He was never a man who was wayward. Um, he was a husband of one wife. He was a father to his children, etc. Um, there are many men who I can't say that about. But Patrick Manning was an example. He lived by example. The most important lessons I would have learned from daddy, uh, he always used to say that there is no right way to do the wrong thing. He was a man of integrity. And as such, I think he, he handed down, if nothing else, integrity to his children. Well, you know, those are extremely big shoes to fill. I, I joke with people that, you know, I'm using a lot of newspaper, you know, but I'm, I'm generally using the lessons that he taught me, but also trying to be myself at the same time. I'm not trying to be a poor copy of my father. Yes, I learned a lot of lessons from him and how to do things and how to manage uh, and how to deal with people within the constituency. But I also want to do things my way and do things a bit differently. So I learned a lot from him and I incorporate a lot of what he did in what I do now. But I also try to do what I believe is best because we live in a different time. It's a, it's a contemporary period. And I believe that some of the, a combination of the two things would be the most effective. I believe we share the same vision for Trinidad and Tobago. We both believe that Trinidad and Tobago can become a first world country, that we have that kind of potential. He believed in Trinidad and Tobago, and so do I. There's a lot we can do and a lot we can become, but we have to, of course, do the necessary to do that. Trinidad and Tobago can, and I believe, will become the industrial capital of this hemisphere. We have the skills, we have the potential, we have the ability to employ every citizen of this country that is willing to qualify and educate themselves. And that is the Trinidad and Tobago that I am striving for.